Lady Charmaine, and my guest today is a DJ and co-founder of the late heavy D in the Boys. And he is a producer, arranger, songwriter, executive, and entrepreneur. And he's also the founder of the Untouchables Entertainment Group and Untouchable Records. And he's here today to talk about the TV One Unsung series, The Story of Heavy D. Help me welcome Mr. DJ Eddie F to the show. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining me on this show today. Now, Eddie, I was reading your bio, and you have such an impressive resume. You've worked with artists over the years like TLC, Stevie Wonder, Mariah Carey, Mary J. Blige, LL Cool J, Will Smith, Jodeci, Destiny's Child, Luther Vandross, Jaheim, and Run DMC, and your list goes on. And before we go into your musical um, history, I want to talk about the TV One Unsung Story that's going to be airing tonight, the story of your partner, your friend, your home me heavy d and i want to know first how did you and heavy even get together how did you guys even become friends and form this group well um mount vernon is a um a small town i mean a lot of a lot of talent and people coming out of there as you see tonight on the show but um i always knew of heavy i didn't know him you know because everybody kind of knew everybody the town was like that but i knew troy really well trouble t roy and you know i had you started DJing and, and doing a lot of the parties, and I basically started doing all the parties at the high school. And Heavy was trying to make a record, and actually it was Trouble T. Roy that introduced us. He 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 called me one day and he said, "Hey man, you know my man Heavy's trying to make a record, and I know you like you know a real popular DJ. I want to link y'all up." And I was actually I was doing I think I was doing a re wedding reception or something at the Mount Vernon Boys Club, and I remember I was setting up like before beforehand. And he bought he bought Heavy, and I'm you know we got formally introduced. Like I said, everybody always knew everybody, but um we got formally introduced. He was like, "Hey man, you know." trying to make a record, you know, I love what you're doing. I was like, yeah, man, I know, you know, we all know the same people. I know you, like, yo, you know, cool brother. And then that, from there, that's how we met. And um, actually, you know, we immediately clicked. Um, you know, we, meet, we were, like, hanging out, like, every day. And um, it was just, like, a great energy. So that's how you guys were able just to form. So how did you come up with the name Heavy D and the Boys? Funny story. It's actually, a, we were trying to figure out, a name for the longest. You know, we had already decided that we wanted to put, um, you know, dancers in the group, not just dancers, because we had we had actually seen Houdini who had dancers, but they weren't a part of the group. So we were like, we want to actually have dancers, but we want to make them a part of the group. So we had, you know, figured out that we everybody was in the group, myself, you know, Heavy, um, G Wiz, Trouble T Roy. And we were trying to figure out a name, trying to figure out a name. And, and Andre Harrell was a fan of Dougie Fresh and the Get Fresh crew. So I think he had suggested some names. You got to be Heavy D and the Come Off crew or Heavy <laughs> D and something. And we were like, and Heavy was always like, nah, man, that's whack. Man, we're not going to do that. And the funny thing, we were in the studio, and a friend of mine, he probably doesn't think I remember this, a friend of mine, Tony Watts, um, who I was real close with in high school, he said, man, we were all sitting in the couch waiting for, I think, the engineer or somebody to come. He was like, man, you know what? That should be Heavy D and the boys, like, with a Z. That would be dope. And that's how, and we were like, oh, that's kind of dope. Yeah, yeah, that's dope. Let's do that. And then that's how we, you know, that's how the name got created. So he, he didn't charge off for the name, did he? <laughs> Oh, nah. That's, that's, the creativity. That's, that's my man. That's my man from way back. Because, you know, these days, anybody have anything to do, if they make a suggestion, they want to make sure their name is on something. So that was good. So I could tell that was a real friend. So how did you both come, start um, even getting a record deal? How did that even come about? Well, um, I used to read, you know, I was I, like I said, I was DJing doing a lot of the parties. And I used to read the records and read all the credits, and I just noticed there was a pattern. There were a lot of records out, a lot of groups who had a single, you know, record here and there. But the artists that were consistent, every single artist that was consistent was part of this company. Um, and I just kept noticing rush management, must rush management. Mm -hmm. Every artist, I think it was like Curtis Blow, Houdini, L. Cool J, Run DMC, and... Um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, <laughs> everybody. There was only one artist that I think the Fat Boys that wasn't with Rush Management. Everybody else was with Rush Management. So um, 
we were just trying to, you know, do a demo one day, and I think I was talking to Heavy, and I said, hey, man, we should try and, you know, all of the hot artists are with this company, so we should try and go here. And we went down to Rush Management. Um, Andre Harrell was actually the vice president of the company. We didn't know what any of that meant at the time. We were just going there trying to meet Russell Simmons. <laughs> so um, we met Andre Harrell. Russell wasn't there. And we didn't know Andre was starting his own company, but, you know, later on he was leaving to start his own company and he wanted us to be on the compilation record. And that's how we met, you know, Andre Harrell and that's how Uptown Records was started. The one thing I love about Heavy D, Heavy D had so much swag to be a big boy. He knew he was heavy, but he was light on his feet. Did he take any dance classes or anything? Because I was one big boy light on his feet. Um, I don't know. He never took any formal dance classes, but his, you know, he heavy has Jamaican heritage and his family. If you know his family, his mom, his dad, like just, you know, his brothers, they're all like, you know, great people. And they were always like, you know, singing and dancing and, you know, like his dad is like super, super cool. Like, you know, we call him cool cuff. And so you can see where heavy got you know, all of that from just being, you know, in a family that always, like, always celebrated and, and had a, had fun dancing, singing. Because he, he was very confident. Because sometimes, you know, you have people that are a little heavy, but they may not be as confident. But like him and Notorious B.I.G., they were very comfortable with their weight. And, and I think it just exudes a certain type of charisma that he had, like with this song, Mr. Big Stuff. But one of my favorite songs by you guys is, I want somebody to love me for me. That's my jam. Wow. Out of all well, y'all jams, that. that one's mine. <laughs> I, well, I, I produced that record, so I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, you are so welcome to know you produced it. You are so welcome. And so how long have you been DJing? So like you, you was DJing before you met Heavy D. So how long you been DJing? Oh, man. I've been DJing since the 80s. <laughs> since, <laughs> way, since way the back. the 80s, since high school. Like, yeah, I think um, I can't remember if it was middle school or high school. Um, my parents bought me DJ equipment, and um, they were actually, you know, both teachers. So sometimes I used to do parties at, you know, at the school or at the um, the teen center. You know, I would, you know, sometimes play the music. So that's how I kind of, like, you know, practiced. And I was like, a, you know, I was young. I was like, you know, maybe 12, 13, 14, and I'd be, like, DJing, you know. I had my setup, my speakers, everything. So, um after a while, like, it was nothing to, like, just DJ in front of people and, you know, do events because I had been doing it for so long. You know, what I find interesting that a, a DJ finds another DJ because many people don't know you dated Spinderella back in the day. Female DJ oh, for salt and pepper. Yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> and, um, you know, we had, like, for, obviously we were both DJs. And I, I was actually, to me, it was so dope that, um, a female was DJing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And just for me, like, coming up, it was like a male-dominated, you know, whole, like, you know, masculine toughness. And then you had this really, 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 like, you know, pretty young lady that was a DJ. So that was just, like, you know, that was instantly, like, intriguing to me. I see. <laughs> I can hear it in your voice, too. Uh, now, after uh, Heavy D's passing, I wanted to know, what are some of your fondest memories of your friend, Heavy D? Um, the first time that we, we um, first time, obviously, that we heard their song on the radio, it was like, it was like, the, it was like the whole Mount Vernon almost like shut down. Like everybody, you you know, you drove through the streets, you just heard everybody blasting the record out of their cars <laughs> and people were driving around. It just it was like a big, huge <laughs> celebration. Um, so that was one, one definitely memorable moment. The other was um, the first time that we ever went to Miami. And I remember it was cold in New York. And we went with, Andre, at that time, you know, we were like the first group on Uptown Records. So Andre Harrell used to travel with us. Our road manager, Kurt Woodley, used to travel with us. So we went to Miami, and we had just come from New York, freezing cold. We had a big ski jacket, <laughs> and we got off the plane. And, you know, we're in Miami. We're going down this trip. We're, like, seeing palm trees. We're like, yo, we're in Miami. And then the funniest thing, we went to check in the hotel, 
and Andre and Kurt were at the lobby checking the hotel. So we went to the back. We went out the, the back door onto the beach, ran straight in the water with <laughs> everything on. See, jackets, pants, everything. We, and I just remember Andre coming. I wish we could have filmed it or something. I remember Andre coming out of the back and say, yo, he was just laughing. He was just falling over laughing. He was like, yo, y'all are crazy. So imagine Heavy being the boys, all four of us, just in the water with big puffy ski jackets and we're in the water because we were so hyped with our clothes on and everything. Uh, now that is a vision. That's funny. <laughs> wow, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing those stories with us. And I, I don't think a lot of people really realize that although you were with Heavy D and the boys, you have such an influence in our musical history because you were also the VP of A&R for the Face Records. And yes. Yes, with TLC and, of course, um, Tony Braxton and all those that were on the Face Records dealing with Usher and everything. So it's, we all just saw the TLC story. So you were there doing that whole process of seeing their success, seeing them blow up and then go bankrupt. So you were there doing all of that. I was there for the whole thing. And, um, you know, the funniest thing was... Um, I remixed their first single, um, Ain't Too Proud to Beg, and I remember L.A. Reid, who was like, you know, I was trying to be a producer, and he was one of, you know, my mentors, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, L.A., and Babyface, and Quincy Jones, those were the guys we all looked up to, so L.A. Reid calls, and he's like, he says, I need some help, you know, with TLC, because they had, you know, he said, I'm going to send you the video, everything, he said, we're having the resistance at R&B Radio, you know, he said, they, because I guess, you know, the record, if you listen to Ain't Too Proud to Beg, it's really, really aggressive. The shouting is real noisy. So coming from a female group, that was something new. So R&B Radio was resisting it, and they didn't know if it was rap, if it was singing. They didn't know what it was. So he sent me the, the record, and I said, oh, I know what to do. So I basically in, just dissected the record, took singing parts out of the vamp in the end and changed it into a singing chorus and made it melodic and stuff for the remix. And I remember sending him the remix and he was so excited. He called me and was like, man, you nailed it. You, you, you know, and <laughs> we got the record on R&B radio that turned out to be a gold single. Um, and one, I was just happy that <laughs> one of my mentors was just, you know, happy with what I had done. And I felt really great about that. And then it also, just seeing the TLC story, because then I also remixed, did the same thing for Creep. Um, I did the remix for Digging On You. Mm -hmm. Not only did the remix, I did the drums, uh, drum tracks and everything for the live mix. The one where you see them with the silver suits and all that. I remember L.A. called me, and um, this is when I was at Vice President and all the face, and I flew down to um, Atlanta, and we did that whole live mix. So when I was watching the TLC story, um, it just really touched me. I just felt like really just honored and proud of them and just happy to be a part of it. And then also sad at the same time because of Lisa mm -hmm. and all the stuff we had done with Left Eye and just with Donnell Jones. And, you know, just it just felt it, I was I was really proud of them. I felt like honored to be a part of it. Um, and I just felt so close with all of them. I, you know, Pebbles, L.A., Dallas Austin, Dallas Austin. When he first was producing, he was doing Boys to Men, ABC. I don't even know if he had done TLC yet. He came to New York to mix the albums, and he didn't know anybody. I remember I just went to the studio, and I think I had a session, and I just ended up staying and just hung out with him just as a friend, and we became friends. And I remember he had done like half of the albums for both of the groups, and I think he was like, man, Mike, Michael Bivens, he wants me to do the rest of the album. Man, I'm, you know, and I guess it was like so much with the groups and all the different members. And I listened to the records, and I was like, man, those records are crazy. Yo, finish the whole album. Just do it. <laughs> and I remember he did it, and Boys and Men sold 10 million, and mm -hmm. then I think ABC sold like 3 or 5 million. And next time I saw Dallas, it was like, yo, <laughs> you know, I sold like, you know, 15 million records. And so it was just, it was just great. You know, and we all just did it because we loved it. I just, you know... I just hung out with Dallas because he was cool. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't about money. It wasn't about who he is. Who I, like, nobody, all of us were just loving music, trying to just get, you know, make great music. We just all following our dreams. So it just was a real special time. Well, I'm glad Dallas Austin did finish that because Motown Philly, as we all know, was a smash. The moment you heard that song from Boys to Men. Absolutely. Absolutely.
And then you also moved to Motown Records as executive vice president of A&R. Now, you had a classic roster over there, including Queen Latifah, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, The Temptations, of course, Boys to Men and Newcomers 98 Degrees at that particular time. And you was also responsible for signing Mario Winans. What was it like for you to move to this legendary label? Um, It was, you know, I, I had come up with so much music and being a DJ and I remember just growing up and, you know, playing with my, my parents' uh, stereo and them having all the 45s and the Motown <laughs> 45s and the Jackson 5. So when I went there, I was just thinking, man, I'm just working that legendary Motown records. And, you know, Diana Ross was still on the label. The Temptations was still on the label. Um, Stevie Wonder. And I actually, um, you know, I put together Stevie Wonder's greatest hits. So I remember, you know, there was a thing where they were like, you know, Stevie being an artist, they were like, oh, you know, we need to like, you know, make sure that he turns in his album. And, you know, just from a, they were treating it from a business standpoint, but I was a producer or artist, a creative person. And I was excited to do the project just as a fan. I wasn't looking at it like as work. I remember I went and I, like I memorized Stevie Wonder's whole catalog, every song he put out. And I knew all the songs forwards and backwards. And I remember I was just waiting before that conference call. When we got on the call, we were going through the records. I had put together a sequence. And he was like, yeah, I like how this goes. And he was just liking musically how things ended and how they went to the next. And, you know, Stevie Wonder being the prolific m musician that he is, he he was like all the key. He was like, yeah, I like that. It's going from a, you know, it's going from a E sharp to a A. <laughs> and, like, and it was like, it, for me, I was just honored to work with him and do it. And um, it's so funny because everybody at the company was kind of like, they were so amazed, like, how'd you get them to do it? And I was like, we just we just did what we do as creative people. We, I was hyped to do it. So, <laughs> so, I mean, it was just a great time. And then we had new, you know, some of the new artists. We had 98 Degrees. We had 702. Um, and, you know... And I had signed Mario Winans, who then ultimately ended up also like going to sign with Bad Boy as a producer. But I gave him his first deal. And the funny thing is, I knew him because when I was at LaFace, and he was a producer at Dark with Dallas Austin. Mm. And I, you know, like I said, I had the relationship with Dallas Austin. That's how I knew Mario Winans in the first place and knew how dope he was. So it all was at that time. It was just all like a tight um, community. And it just was really just a, a really special time. And I can hear it in your voice. Do you think that the music industry still has that same close community feel that you did back then in the early 90s? Um, it, it does, but also at the same time, there's a lot of traffic. There's a lot, and people's attention span is shorter because there are more choices. So it's not that, you know, and I'm not one of those people that subscribe to, oh, music of today, it's not music, and this. I'm like, I just love all music. I love what um, people are doing today. You know, I'm friends with a lot of the, you know, brand new guys like Mike Will and Bangladesh and all these producers. I'm friends with all these guys, and I love their music. Um, so I think what it is is that back then you had, you had six producers you had, let's just say, 40 groups that were making, you know, on rotation. You would hear 10 groups per year, you know, through all the different labels. The difference is now you got a thousand, a thousand producers. <laughs> you have, you know, 500 artists all vying for your attention. Mm. But it's just like anything else. It's not, it's not the music. It's just the te technology. It's the information age. It's just like, you know, same thing goes for... You used to have to go to the library if you wanted to research something because you had to go, you know, get books or encyclopedias. Now you just Google. It's all right there. So it's the same thing with music. It's just all the information is right there. So it's hard to keep people's attention span. But at the same time, there's a lot of great music, a lot of great artists. And I'm proud to say that a lot of artists that are even out now, um, like the Mariah Carey's, like the Beyonce's, do Destiny's Child, like jay Z. Like, a lot of these people, you know, I was a part of their early beginnings. So I look at it, and I'm just 
I just feel blessed to be a part of it. That's a blessing. And you were also in the early beginning of Donnell Jones. We know his uh, song, You Know What's Up, featuring uh, Left Eye. Could you mention that earlier? So you've seen the beginning of a lot of people because you also discovered him, right? Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's, that's my dude right there. I mean, that's, he's like, I watched him from just being a singer, not even being a producer, to being a full-blown, prolific producer, you know, that writes songs that sings his record and then goes and does a show and sounds exactly like his song, mm. like, like he's singing. Like you would think he's lip-singing, but he's not. I love singers like that. When you see them in concert, they sound like the record. I do not like singers that they sing a certain way on an album and then you get in concert and they have this whole different type of remix. I can't sing along with you. That's not the record that I bought. <laughs> I want you to right. sing so I can sing along with you so I can enjoy the song. That's what I love about Smokey Robinson. You can go to a Smokey Robinson concert and he sings just like his records. He don't change it up. Right. You know, you don't have to go there getting frustrated. Tell me, where you go? All of a sudden he wants to do a slow mix on a fast song or he just sings the, the same classic classics that you knew back in the day exactly and, and many people don't know i'm, I'm going to talk all about your history because i'm all in your stuff okay you also created the theme song for in living color yes i did i did actually um create that song and um it's funny a lot of people you know nowadays when i talk to people and they say you did that <laughs> and they're like man that was my jam and um the funny thing when we did the song we um we try to do it. My whole intent with the music was to make it sound like a record, like not sound like a theme song. It was like, I want this to sound like a record that you would hear in the club. <laughs> <laughs> and we put a B section as the hook. Like we just did all these things to make it sound, you know, no different than songs that we were doing um, and remixing. And I think you did a great job because when it comes on, it does sound like a record. The, the beat is there. The bass is there. And who don't remember the song? In Living Color. I mean, people can still sing that song today. And although it really wasn't long, but you did a great job on the song. And also, you were also in, in collaborations with two up-and-coming artists at that particular time. You did a, a song with Tupac and Notorious B.I.G. on the title track, Let's Get It On. How did you manage that? Uh, you know what? They were both up and coming at the time, and we had been on the road with Pac. We had been on the road with Pac when he was the roadie for Digital Underground, mm -hmm. and he wasn't even he wasn't even Tupac the rapper yet. He could rap, but he was Tupac the roadie. And for people that don't know what a roadie is, a roadie is a person that like you know like make sure that you know the artists are on the bus when they're supposed to. Make sure that you know. In charge of, like, you know, calling the hotel, the bellmen people, make sure they, you know, coordinate getting the bags on the bus. And, and he was just an all-around cool dude. Like, everybody just loved Pac. Like, his personality was just, you know, just so... Put, like, if you want to really know the, like, real Pac, like, I know a lot of stuff happened afterwards and all that stuff, but the real Pac, if you look at I Get Around video, he's just running around and... You know, he says in there a lot, still climbing with the, with the underground. Like, that's the pop that we all knew, and he was just a fun guy. So, you know, obviously, you know, he was, he was still, he was still for street, he was still from the hood, but he was a fun, personable, just funny guy. And so I knew him from that. So when I was doing my album, it was just like, yo, I want you to get on this song, and, you know, with him and, 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 and Kuba. And then it's like Biggie was just coming into the Uptown family with Puff. And Puff actually used to live at my house when he was just eight, when there wasn't any bad boy at all. He lived at my house. <laughs> um, and so I was like, yo, we should put Biggie on there. And it was that, like, so it was more like a, a creative collaboration. I had no idea that it was going to be like Biggie and Pac. Like, like right. how they ended up being icons, you know, rap icons. Um, but I'm definitely proud of that. I'm proud of it to have, and it's not a remix. Like, they both did the song. You know, I didn't, like, you know, put the vocals together later. It was, like, so it was, like, just dope. I mean, again, I feel blessed to just, to even say that I had, like, I did an album and had them both on the song together is, like, to me is, like, you know, I think about stuff like that, and I just feel, you know, special. 
<laughs> but it's great because you are true and are you a true artist and relations you know talent and in order for you to even have those positions you have to know talent you have to know artists and that just seemed like a gift that you have because also you produce music for not only tv and film but also for bet centric mcdonald's heineken jeep and chrysler you are truly an instrumentalist that know his music how did you even transition over into tv and film and also scoring for uh tv campaigns well, you know, it's it's just like what I was just saying to you about um about the in living color. Um, I just take I just love music and I, I realized that I had done some stuff, you know, a long time ago, Sprite commercial and I had done you know, in living color and I'd done some stuff for Heineken and, and I was just thinking to myself, Hey, I'm kinda like doing like music for commercials and T V and then I just said, you know, I might need to focus on this. <laughs> and I started, you know, focusing on it. And um, I've had, you know, some, been blessed to, like, really work with a lot of great people. Um, you know, at BET, um, Centric, VH1. I'm doing some stuff right now with Revolt, you know, with, mm -hmm. with Puff and Andre over there, and I'm doing, you know, music for them. And, um, you know, I don't talk about it that much. But, you know, I, it's just something that I love doing. And actually, it's, it's great for me because... They're really excited when I when I work with the network because um, they feel like it's, I'm taking the attitude of like I'm producing an artist. I'm not doing it like oh it's music for TV, so I'm gonna kind of like not you know try as hard or give it as quality. I just treat everything the same way. I just try to make think outside the box and say. I want it just to be like a hit record. I don't want it to be like a song for TV. I want it to be like a hit record. Like if you take it off a of TV, you could you could play it on the radio or play it in the club. And um and the and a lot of the networks they appreciate that. Cause I love jingles and I do a throwback show and I have so many jingles from when I grew up, you know, in the eighties, like from you know McDonald's, Big Mac, Filet of Fish, Quarter Pound. You know, ba back in those days, I, I, I love songs you can sing along. You know, um, I like to teach the world to sing Coca Cola in Perfect Harmony. You know, if I could buy the world a Coke and teach them, <laughs> you know what I mean. I, I love those particular songs, like the Dr Pepper songs. I wish we had more jingles like that coming back because it keeps that brand in your mind like the well, living color theme go ahead that's what i'm working on i'm so that's exactly what that's my vision is to to treat music for film and television just like that like how it how it how it i guess used to be or i mean you still have memorable campaigns but i want to make every campaign a memorable campaign um just like when we were at uptown records we wanted every record Every song wanted to be the first single. <laughs> so same same mentality. And I think that's great because you give me something to sing to. You, look, you didn't sold me with your brand. If I could sing your song, if I could remember your song, and like I said, I could still sing all those songs. And I went back and found them on YouTube just for my show because I still love those same old jingles back in the day. And I, I'm so glad that you're trying to bring that back. And I, we look forward to watching TV One's Unsung Tonight, the story of Heavy D airing tonight, 8, 7 Central. Now, are you going to be featured on the show? Yes, I'm absolutely on the show. I'm actually all all through the show. Awesome. <laughs> um. <laughs> Well, good. So we get to hear directly from you on the show. And again, thank you so much. And I definitely wish you the best of luck with your career. It sounds like God has more things in store for you. And we just can't wait to see what's ahead of you. Thank you. Appreciate it.